Welcome to lecture 14 of biology 115 entitled DNA. We are now finally at the halfway point, believe it or not, of biology 115. And at this halfway point, we're going to begin speaking about DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And this first flowchart for this lecture series is going to be entitled DNA Intro. Just an introduction to what DNA is and its discovery, which is a very important part of this lecture and an important part to understand and appreciate when studying DNA. So first and foremost, we all know that DNA is genetic material. That's a basic fact of DNA. It is material that holds genes. It is genes. It encompasses genes. But we want to look a little further into this idea of it being genetic material. And a good way to look into that is to look at where DNA, this genetic material, is housed. Where is this DNA found? And this DNA is most often found within distinct units of heredity called chromosomes, which you should be very, very comfortable with after looking at Mendelian and non-Mendelian genetics. In these chromosomes, interestingly enough, we actually don't have just DNA. We actually have two different things. If you remember, we have DNA and we also have proteins, those histone proteins that are a part of the chromosome structure. DNA and proteins. So we know that chromosomes are the hereditable unit. They're the unit that's passed on. But we have to imagine, but let's say 100 years ago, we don't know whether or not DNA is the genetic material or whether or not proteins are the genetic material, but we do know that chromosomes are alive and well. So what we have to figure out is whether or not DNA, with its four nucleotides, and those nucleotides are, which we'll learn about, A, T, C, and G, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, whether or not these four nucleotides consist and make up the genetic material that we know of, or whether or not the proteins that are within the chromosomes, proteins which are just basically aggregates of 20 different amino acids, which one of these is the real genetic material? Now, of course, you know right now that it's DNA. That's a fact. But what we have to imagine is, you know, about 100 years ago, there was no clue whatsoever as to which of these was the true genetic material. So we have to ask ourselves and sort of go backwards in time, which are the genes? Which are the genetic information? Which possess genetic information? And believe it or not, very early on, so we're going to write this down, very early hypothesis, let's say, was actually for proteins. Because people thought very early on, proteins being so important and so crucial and all over the body and made all the time, maybe proteins are the genetic material that are seen within chromosomes. Now, of course, we know it's DNA, but I think it's very important now to figure out why it's DNA. What empirical evidence do we have over the course of scientific history that tells us that it's DNA? And I think it's very fascinating to look at the following couple of experiments, which we'll break up into two, just two separate videos, because there are, I believe, one, two, and three experiments. It's worth breaking them up so that we understand them and appreciate them for what they are wholeheartedly. So there are many experiments to prove whether or not proteins or DNA are the genetic information. That's our overarching question right now in this DNA intro. Is it proteins or is it DNA that's passed on and accepted as hereditable units? So the first experiment that we're going to be looking at is by a man named Fred Griffith. So we'll do this first experiment um, right underneath here. And it was by Fred Griffith. Fred Griffith completed this experiment in 1928, and he was the first person to tell us the following. He was actually uh, considered the first to uh, officially reject the protein hypothesis. So we'll say reject, oops, we'll say, let me erase that, reject protein hypothesis. First to reject protein hypothesis, and also the first to suggest what do you think? Of course, suggest DNA. And again, what's the question that we're asking? Which are genes, DNA or proteins? He was the first to reject the protein hypothesis and the first to suggest that it's DNA. So how did he do this? Well, what he did was he looked at something called streptococcus pneumonia. 
streptococcus. Now try to write this as neatly as possible. Pneumonia. Make sure I spelled this correctly. Okay, so streptococcus pneumonia. This is a bacteria, and this is specifically we'll write a bacteria with two strains. Okay, what I mean by strains is there are two versions to streptococcus pneumonia, and this bacteria presents itself in the following ways. It can either be of the smooth strain or of the rough strain. So there are two versions. Imagine this being like two different um, phenotypes that this streptococcus pneumoniae can express. It can either be smooth, with this, which is usually just labeled as S, or rough, which is usually just labeled as R. Very simple. But what does smooth really mean? Well, smooth means that when you plate it, when you put it on an agar plate and let this bacteria grow on that plate, you end up with, you guessed it, smooth colonies it grows as smooth colonies. And what do you think the rough strain of streptococcus pneumonia does? This, of course, grows into rough colonies. They are not smooth to the touch. They are very rough and, uh, let's say, rigid, whereas these are much smoother, much shinier. It's very easy to see. I highly suggest looking at a picture, Google image this. It's very, very interesting. But what about this whole question again? DNA or proteins? What does this have to do with that? Let's get to it. So, smooth, shiny colonies are presented in the smooth strain of this bacteria. This is because this bacteria possesses something known as a polysaccharide capsule. Polysaccharide, I'm just going to abbreviate it, capsule. Interestingly enough, when you have a polysaccharide capsule and you are a bacteria, this becomes sort of a, I'm going to write this on the side, a protective mechanism. So we'll say protective, M-E-C-H, mechanism. Who do you think this is protecting it against? Bacteria are often going to be attacked by immune systems. Immune systems will try to get rid of them, but when a bacteria has a polysaccharide capsule on it, the immune system has a much more difficult time getting rid of it, and thus, when you have a smooth colony or a smooth strain of streptococcus pneumoniae, that strain is considered virulent. Now, please don't confuse this with the idea of it being a virus. Virulent, as you define it, if you look up the definition, simply means that it is dangerous. Specifically, let's imagine this experiment that Fred Griffith did. What he did was he noticed that it kills. It actually kills injected, and I know I'm trying to squeeze this in over here, injected mice. You take smooth streptococcus pneumoniae strain, you can put it into an injection, put it into a vial, and inject mice. You will notice that because of its virulence, because of its polysaccharide capsule, because of its smoothness thus, it kills injected mice. Rough colonies are a little bit different. Rough colonies actually do not have a smooth capsule. They have no capsule. So you know what happens with these guys? The immune system is very easily able to get rid of rough bacteria that are streptococcus pneumoniae. And in order for that to happen, you end up with the result of not virulence or virulent, but avirulent, and which in biology we know means without virulence. And this means that the injected mice, do they die? Of course not. Avirulent means that injected mice live. So, still haven't mentioned anything about DNA. What is all this background information for? And what is the necessary part of this that you need to understand? You absolutely need to understand this background information because now I can teach you and show you the genius experiment that Fred Griffith did. So I'm going to write down the experiment. Nice and bold up here. Very dramatic. This is the experiment that he did. What he did was, step one, was he took live S, meaning that he took S strain of Back, uh, streptococcus pneumonia bacteria, and he injected it. So we'll do next step of inject. And what do you think happens to the mouse? Based off of our background knowledge, of course, mice die upon this injection. So we'll write mice die. Very sad, okay, but this is all for science. So let's figure out what happens if he does the second option. The second option was to take, of course, live R. And when I say live, I just mean active. Um, a strain of streptococcus pneumoniae that's live is an active strain that is alive. That's literally what it means. And if you take live R strain and you inject it, and this is all in mice, you inject it into mice, what happens? The mice lives. 
based off of our background knowledge. But now I want you to apply some novel knowledge. Okay, I want you to get some new knowledge out of the following thing that he did. In a third option, what he did was he took something called heat killed. Let me rewrite that. I want to make sure this is very clear. It's called heat dash killed S. He took a strain of S that was heat killed. Do you think that strain of S upon injection will kill something if it is heat killed? Think about it like this. If I take you and I heat kill you, are you alive anymore? Of course not. The same idea for Streptococcus pneumoniae smooth strain. Heat killed S upon injection, so we'll say inject into the mice, will actually Will it kill the mice? No, it actually saw the mice live. So this is interesting. The genius that Fred Griffith was was like, all right, you know what? I want to know more about this. So in step four, what he did was he took live R, which we know is avirulent. It's okay. It's safe. And he said, let me combine it with something that's kind of weird, HKS for heat killed S. And I'm going to inject this novel combination into my mice. And what he saw was that the mice die. This is incredible. This is interesting. This is very, very interesting. The mice die, and so much so that he actually was able to do the following. He actually recovered live, live S cells from this dead mouse. So what the heck just happened? I just took dead S cells, combined them with live R cells, R strain, and with dead S strain, and I ended up with a dead mouse and also somehow, some way, live S cells. Well, what we can state about this, and we're going to just write it over here, um, I would include it right over here as sort of a extension of this knowledge but since we don't have room here I'll just summarize everything and finish up this video on the following note what we have to state is that something and I'll put it in quotes for right now because you obviously know what that something is something in HKS the heat killed S strain made R made R the R strain which is not virulent virulent Something changed the way R act. Something. I don't know what it is. That's one premise that we have. Based off of this premise, we can state that the thing that happened is known as transformation. This is an important term that you should understand. Transformation occurred in the sense that transformation is simply a genetic change. A genetic change. And why are we focusing on genetic change? Let me rewrite that real quick. Genetic change, because this is all about genetic material. It's all about DNA. A genetic change occurred, so much so, in which the dead S cells transformed their properties. Their, the dead S cells' properties, which were virulence, transformed that's the key word here so I'm gonna write trans I'm not gonna be able to squeeze it in here transformed onto living R cells end all be all if I mix live R cells with dead heat killed S cells what ends up happening is a transformation a transformation in the sense that the genes of the R which are usually avirulent turn virulent through a process known as transformation. This is overall entitled the transforming principle. The overall title of this flowchart you can even say is the transformation principle. Established by who? Fred Griffith. What you should understand and walk away with from this flowchart absolutely is that Fred Griffith was able to prove that DNA is the genetic material because he was able to change the way something acted through this process known as transformation by this step four that he completed right over here. This is a big step. Understand why we recovered live S cells through the process of transformation, turning something that was avirulent to virulent. This shows that genetic material was passed, and later on we'll see how that specifically, this transformation principle, shows that it must have been DNA.